Hello, and welcome to Cloud Insiders, a podcast that brings cloud down to earth. Hello, and welcome to Cloud Insiders. Today, we are talking about data management as a service, or DMAS as the kids will no doubt be calling it. We are joined by Dave Packer, Vice President of Product and Alliances Marketing at Druva. Hi there. Hey, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. And we are also joined by Alex Galbraith, a blogger for TechHead and the co-host of Open Techcast. He is a solutions architect for a global service provider. Hello there. Hi there, Stuart. Thanks very much for having me on the show. No worries. Thanks for coming on. So if you could introduce yourselves and give us a brief um, bit of information about yourselves, if we start with you, Dave. Yeah, sure. Um, my role at Druva is to uh, basically you know, enable the organization to kind of put together the product strategy, the product direction of what we do within uh, data management as a service. You know, uh, so how do we define our portfolio? How do we engage with customers and really understanding kind of, you know, their needs, where they're going, where they see kind of the big uh, speed bumps coming up in the future. So, you know, obviously things like GDPR play into that. Um, at, when we're looking at uh, data management, ensuring that, you uh, you know, we're delivering to customers against kind of, you know, their challenges and what they need today. Cool, that's brilliant. And Alex? Um, yeah, as you mentioned, Stuart, I'm a solutions architect at a global service provider. So um, my background is uh, very much in the storage and virtualization and um, and Wintel kind of space um, in, in the olden days, ye olden days pre-cloud. Um, and then uh, more recently moved into doing a lot more um, work around cloud architecture, particularly AWS, Azure, and uh, currently studying towards my Google exams as well. well that's brilliant. I mean, I, I can see from your website that you are um, just surrounding yourself by certifications at the moment. Yeah, massive certainty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So if I aim this first one at you, Dave, um, what is data management as a service and what does it involve? So, you know, most businesses today are familiar with elements around their life cycle management of data, you know, whether they're doing them or not is another question and to what extent. And, you know, one of the elements we see today, I think that's been a growing concern is when you see the amount of data organizations are dealing with kind of uh, the business challenges that are then against that data. So things like, you know, ransomware or compliance, you know, uh, domestically we deal with HIPAA, you know, there's GDPR, there's um, all sorts of regulations around data, um, as well as things like, you know, the long-term storage of data and how you manage that. It's become much more complex because the environment's become a lot more complex. Um, we're not dealing with just data, you know, in the data center. And as I like to tell people, you know, the data center is no longer really the center of data for most businesses. It's a component that's usually spread across a lot of various elements in the business. So, you know, data management as a service is a focus on how do you bring this information together, this data together in a way that provides manageability, oversight, the ability to align better to both internal data needs as well as uh, against external forces and regulations or uh, challenges around uh, you know, resiliency of data. You know, when uh, you, you think about it today, uh, when we start talking about as a service, what we're uh, focusing on is taking away all the plumbing uh, and the headache of administration and manageability and really providing it in a way that is easily accessible by the different constituencies in the business that need to have access to data, uh, but also provide it in a way that it's very turnkey. You know, as a business, you get the service, you, you know, pay a regular rate for it, but it allows you to then do what ultimately you're trying to achieve rather than having to think about, you know, building it. And, uh, you know, I, uh, one analogy I use is, you know, if you want to drive to the store, you don't put your car together and build it and put the wheels on and then jump in and drive to the store. You know, you, you buy a car and use that or even uh, better, you uh, use a service like Uber, right? And uh, that takes you to the store and brings you back. And so we really are looking for that level of simplicity. Um, and data management is really about helping get the arms around all of this again for organizations, which has uh, really been the challenge. And um, allowing organizations to manage data through their proper life cycle and ensure that they aren't dealing with the risks or I mean, they're not faced with these risks. So it's a, an evolving area, a lot of different folks involved in it and players in the market. 
but it's definitely because of things like cloud allows us to address it in a different way and uh, actually solve a lot of the challenges that businesses have classically faced when they've been uh, trying to go through uh, the data management lifecycle for, um, for, the, for their organizations. Two of the key things that kind of got drawn out for me there were um, one is the as a service model, which obviously, you know, so many businesses are moving towards that from getting away from the kind of uh, traditional CapEx buy sell type purchasing cycle. But the other one is around the actual management piece. And it sounds to me like data management as a service is as much about um, making the management of your data be policy driven, which is another big trend that we're right. seeing a lot around the IT industry. Yes, definitely. I mean, well, ultimately, at the end of the day, you start looking at petabytes of data, right? Um, policy management, policy enforcement, all of those um, and meeting SLAs of the business, you know, become quite tricky, you know, kind of using the kind of the classic model. So, you know, the real focus on, you know, how do you implement and manage policy across large volumes of data, especially uh, is a key kind of core focus of data management as a service. You mean to tell me admins don't enjoy writing rsync scripts anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to, trying to help folks get away from that and uh, manage <laughs> that, yes. <laughs> so what I'm getting from this is it's all about data protection, data governance, and intelligence. Um, they're all related. Is this something you can agree with? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, the, at the core, we look at, you know, what a business is, you know, kind of, I kind of look at this kind of like the three things that businesses are trying to achieve. Some of them are, you know, foundational, right, like data protection, where, you know, how, how do we provide data resiliency at the end of the day? And do that in a, fa- a fashion that's a cost efficient, but uh, b uh, allows us to have uh, as much immediate access to our data if there is some type of catastrophic event or something happens. And so, you know, data protection is really at the core, right? And it's also when you think about data protection, um, what you're doing at ultimately end of the day, if you were collecting broadly across an enterprise, which is really kind of uh, DMAS's kind of focus is, you know, get a view on all your data. What it allows for then is the ability for the business to, um, you know, have that resiliency, have that protection, but also with that visibility comes the kind of the added value of providing a uh, facility for governance, right? So visibility, uh, who has access to data, where that data is, who's working on it, you know, is it in Office 365? Is it in some kind of, uh, you know, cloud native workload of our business, you know, inside of AWS? Is it, you know, in our VMware environment? Is a you know, in a, in a virtualized machine? So where is that data? How is it being operated on? Um, What if it's needed for compliance purposes? You know, as I mentioned, like GDPR earlier, you know, knowing these things helps for better hygiene, which ultimately leads to better alignment. Uh, And I I think that's, you know, a core of businesses where a lot of companies have gotten frustrated because they just can't achieve that same level of hygiene and resiliency and availability of the data that's really become you know, a need that's been somewhat lost. You know, I, I tell people, you know, you rewind the clock, you know, eight years and you'll find that people at that point in time, everything was very local. So data was more accessible to the business. Um, didn't mean it didn't take a lot of work, but um, you didn't have to really be as concerned. In today's world, you know, between compliance and litigation and, you know, the long-term holding of data for archiving purposes, et cetera, the, the model has gotten so complex for a lot of businesses that uh, they almost throw up their hands and say, I, I don't even know where to start to untangle this giant roll of yarn. So, you know, and then lastly, it's just the intelligence piece. Like I mentioned earlier, we start talking about petabytes of data. We have for example, one customer has 12 petabytes. You know, you have to have different ways to look at that information and understand it. You can't you know use the traditional manual processes. It's not just about having access and visibility. It's about tools that help you mine that data, understand what's there, identify potentially latent risks in the data or issues, of accessibility, or um, you know the content itself. Maybe there is unstructured data out there that has information uh, that's PII related um, that does uh, actually fall out of compliance for something like GDPR. So um, it's things like that, you know, it's like you've collected all this data, that's what, you know, the protection side provides, but now what can you do with it? It's really not about backup and recovery, it's more beyond that, right? Uh, And giving organizations the tools to be much more effective 
uh, to you know solve business challenges. And I think ultimately uh, that's what businesses are most concerned about are the risks that are being created by the volumes of data they're dealing with today. Yeah. I completely agree with you. I think what's interesting there is actually, I think, you know, da data protection and data intelligence, data governance, they're all kind of different phases almost of the data management life cycle, but some, some are restricted right. to parts of the phases or uh, whereas some of them are more kind of overarching, you know, data governance, for example. But if you look at a typical kind of data life cycle, so, you, you know, you go from ingestion through to processing and analysis and then storage and then maybe later on you you know you might want to look at it again but maybe you're just archiving it off and then in theory destroying it when you no longer need it which is which is one of the things gdpr is going to be encouraging people to do um but are all phases throughout that the thing that is always most critical to get right from the get-go is classification so if you right, don't know right. what that data is and if you can't identify what that data is in terms of as you, you've already mentioned like pii or or other types of data, you, you're already on a on a losing footing. I think that's probably where where organizations struggle the most, but it's also the thing that they need to concentrate on the most. Because once you know yeah, what the data agree. is, then it's 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 a much it, you know you're in a much safer position. To your point about you know if there's data in say Office 365, if it's not important data, if it's not IP or PII type data, do you care? Whereas other types of data might be sitting somewhere where you could be quite scared if it gets out into the public. Exactly. And I think that's the, you know, the, the ability to, you know, be able to do that upfront understanding of that data to be able to achieve those kind of elements. Th those are things that are possibilities today. Um, but, you know, what, uh, what we're really trying to unlock is the ability to a, do that, but also, you know, um, and I'm sure you've seen this as well. Um, I, I feel a lot of companies I've talked to today have almost given up on the the purging of data at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Which is, um, you know, it's big uh, data now, though, isn't it? That, that just means you don't yeah, have to it delete is, it. It's big data, but not in the way that it's <laughs> data is defined. Um, uh, it's uh, you know, you the, the amount of what they call dark data, right, it, is growing. And it, you know, I go into businesses and they tell me they, you know, their philosophy is basically just keep everything, right? And you start thinking about the volumes of information. There's a, a lot of challenges in there, especially you know, as you mentioned. You know, we go back to GDPR and industry that because it's very timely, obviously, that's coming up in a few months here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, one of the elements about right to be forgotten, you know, there's a lot of data, a lot of dark data. How are you going to know if uh, you've actually exercised that and best, the uh, you know, best faith for somebody who's asked for that right? Absolutely. I, I think in in the modern world, that's difficult. I mean, I even think you could probably even find somebody's, you know, six months, uh, you know, uh, data backup that's got data in it and they don't even know it. Yeah. How do you marry up the need of, uh, of an organization to keep, say, seven years worth of data whilst at the same time a customer says, I want my data deleted? <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Cool. So you've kind of mentioned a couple of points there, um, but what are the industry trends that you see driving the adoption of data management? Is it just things like GDPR that are popping up or is it, you know, the ever increasing mobile workforce or are there other forces at play here? Um, I think there's quite a few forces, even even above and beyond the the kind of the ones that you would maybe immediately think of. I mean, the, the, starting quite simply, more data ingested up front means you know more headaches down the line, and the and the growth rate of data you know in this current age is just insane. Mm. Um, but some of the trends that are kind of driving into that, I, th I see things like you know mobile and increased homeworking enabled by things like improved bandwidth and uh, low cost, that's that's immediately starting to cause more of a distribution of data because mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of users going to be using, you know, even simple things like Dropbox, OneDrive, etc. to start to uh, disperse that data. You've got things like hybrid cloud models where uh, organizations or m maybe even multi-cloud models um, where organizations are starting to look at what's the right cloud to put the right workload on but what that obviously increases then is the sprawl of the data as well as potentially multiple copies because maybe you've got the you know workload sitting in your SaaS providers environment uh, but at the same time you need to then send it off to your private cloud or your public cloud to be able to process it in some other fashion mm -hmm. um, so again that's kind of uh, you know increasing an element of risk there around um, where that data sits um, compliance and legal, you know, e-discovery requests and, you know, GDPR, as, uh, as Dave mentioned, um, that's certainly going to be on the rise. And then um, I think something that's probably a little bit, maybe it's a bit cheesy, but, you know, we talk about millennials quite a lot, but millennials expect to have that immediate access to data wherever they are, 
and so being able to provide the performance that they need but at the same time the immediate access again it's going to start dispersing that data all over the place so i think you know from a from a an end user perspective there's a, a wide variety of different things which are, are driving that data just moving all over the place and and really making it so that you need to have i guess it admins are probably freaking out a little bit because <laughs> you know we're, we're all about control <laughs> And this is this right. is exactly the opposite. This data is just going everywhere. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I agree hundred percent with that. I mean, I think that puts a ton of pressure on IT. Nobody wants to be the the part of the organization that says, "I don't know," right? Um, you know, I don't know where my data is. I don't know how to recover it, or I don't know uh, what risks are there, or. Worst case, you know, a, a major IP litigation comes in and they have to go do the discovery process of collecting data. Where yep. do you even start? And, you know, I, I, I'd say that one interesting dynamic today, and I'm sure Alex, you've seen this too, is, you know, customers, you know, they're going cross region in, inside of like AWS. They've got multiple buckets there, uh, but they don't really know what data is where completely, <laughs> right? Um, even yep. though they have the tagging and everything else, it's, it still becomes very unmanageable. And that's just one dynamic, right? Uh, so, yeah, I'd say there's a lot of elements when people are faced with, you know, okay, regulations, SLAs, uh, resiliency of the business. You know, when you start bringing those together, then the, you know, ha- where data management fits in is right there, You're trying to help solve that problem. Absolutely. And, and actually, it's quite timely you mentioned S3 buckets there. I was reading a news article on the BBC where there is a, a hacker organization out there who's now invented effectively a Google search for S3 buckets. Um, yeah, right. So if you, <laughs> if you go ahead and leave your S3 bucket open to the world, you know, and it's potentially sometimes non-IT admins who are, you know, moving that data around and putting it in places where they're not necessarily used to securing it in the same way, you know, you're opening right. yourself up to being the next, you know, the next, uh, I don't know, the, the, um, MOD or, or, or large organization who's, accidentally um, leaked quite a large inf- amount of information. Right, right. So, you know, it, it, it is the, you know, the cloud offers a ton of advantages uh, for people to, you know, uh, run workloads and manage data. At the same time, you have to be aware of kind of, you know, the, uh, the potential trips and, you know, hurdles if you're, if you're not managing it quarterly or understanding kind of what you got where and how it's exposed. Yep. So do you find that people are addressing protection of data? I mean, are they taking it seriously enough, would you say, or are they trying to palm it off between other departments? I think that's a really interesting question um, <laughs> because I think that there's, there's, there's different, shall we say this politely, there's different viewpoints on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I think businesses and IT departments as well, I mean, I've kind of alluded to it already. I think um, the attitude in, in IT departments is always very focused around control, management, security of that data. Um, but that's because that's where we are um, prioritized and targeted within our roles. That's what that's what we're all about. Um, other departments, maybe I, w- I wouldn't say they necessarily turn a blind eye, but <laughs> maybe because it's not a priority to them, they don't necessarily see it uh, as the same kind of, uh, of an issue. So, you know, in, in the old people process and technology, you know, the technology bit is the bit that we're very good at. But it often oftentimes it's more of a, a people in a process problem. I think. Um, Gartner was saying, what was it, about five years ago or something like that, CMOs are going to have a bigger IT budget than IT will <laughs> by, I think it was supposed to be by about now. So that I don't think they've done that quite yet, but it does beg the question about who knows more about managing and protecting the data. Is it the CMO or is it the CTO or the CIO? I think, you know, things like one of the very common ones I see is, is things like digital agencies spinning up platforms on behalf of the CMO or, or whatever. And, you know, perhaps they're collecting quite a significant amount of PII data, for example, um, but they don't necessarily have that same focus around protecting that data. Yeah, I, I mean, I see it. I see it a very similar way. I, I think what you run into is line of businesses are really trying to solve line of businesses challenges, right? So, as you mentioned, the CMO was really focused on not data protection, resiliency, recoverability, and compliance. <laughs> he's, he's very he's, he's very much focused on you know demand generation interest, awareness of the business, ensuring, you know, proper customer engagement or customer delight, as they call it, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, what we see is most lines of businesses, you know, you can go to finance or, you know, sales or whatever, are adopting applications based on solving that line of business need. Yep. 
in a way circumventing IT because it doesn't require the same IT resource anymore, right? If you uh, you know take a product like Salesforce, for example, you know you'll find that you know the sales part of the organization typically you know they're the ones who, who adopt it and start using it. They get their own Salesforce admin, and that's pretty much all they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now the question becomes a little bit of a, of a complex one because the IT you know maybe they they're managing an element of it, you know maybe they're managing the users or something like that, uh, or the keys or the licenses, uh, but. Fundamentally, uh, when thinking about the, you know, the whole landscape of your enterprise data and kind of the issues you might run into, um, that is now an element of it, and um, that's out of your direct control predominantly. Um, So, you know, creating, you know, tools and things like that to help bring that together is really the core of what data management services really trying to provide. And I'd say that, you know, one, one thing interesting is in Salesforce, I believe it was about two years back, there was a litigation where two sales reps were uh, fired from a company uh, and then they turned and uh, sued the company for wrongful termination. And uh, part of their uh, e-discovery request was their Salesforce data that they had been working on at the time. And, that wasn't there. <laughs> it was, you know, it had been, you know, the Salesforce records had all been appropriated to another salesperson. The yep. uh, records had been altered, notes had been deleted um, or purged. And so uh, that became a crux of the lawsuit and the company ultimately lost because uh, they weren't able to produce the right information to show kind of what the status of that salesperson's performance was at that point in time. So, you know, these are real problems of the business that, that, um, you know, organizations need to be thinking about, but also trying to figure out how do do you adapt to the changing world? It's going to continue to go on this vector. It's not going to be static. It's going to keep changing dynamically as services become uh, more available. Uh, Then the question becomes, how do you adapt to the spread? Yep. And and how do you do that whilst not alienating the business as well? Because exactly. IT always wants yeah. to increase that control. But we're in an era now where I think there's more focus in the IT industry around how do we help the businesses that we are aligned with, um, as opposed to how do we do IT? So I think the language has changed and the attitudes have changed quite a lot, even just in the last five or 10 years. And the last thing we want to do is exert so much control that you know we're, we're kind of back at square one again so it's kind of finding a right balance between that control and protection and governance but at the same time allowing the business to be relatively flexible in what they do and, and mm-hmm. agile more than anything because the last thing business is about to do is just about to get say slowed that. down yeah. <laughs> right you don't want to undermine agility but at the same time you still need to address those challenges so it's funny you mentioned agility. I mean, so if we come back to you, Alex, quickly, I mean, what would you say are the main benefits of adopting data management as a service? So I, I work with kind of mid-market and enterprise organizations over the past five, 10 years, most commonly. And what they're mostly about is around reducing risk. So they they want to, to Dave's point earlier on, um, you know, they want to be accelerating growth and, uh, you know, being agile as a business, but at the same time, around IT strategy, it's often about reducing risk. And that's that's commonly why, you know, for example, um, businesses go to service providers because they know that by utilizing a service provider, they're actually going to reduce the risk to the, you know, internally within the business. Yeah. Um, I think another another key kind of benefit around it, though, would be around um, brand and IP protection because it only takes, uh, you know, flicking through the last few pages on the technology news um, or on the BBC news and, and you see the number of uh, organizations where data has just, uh, you know, accidentally appeared on the internet by virtue of it not having been controlled appropriately um and then i think the last one is um obviously compliance you know i don't think we've talked about compliance a great deal which is amazing because we're talking about <laughs> data management and I, I was i was thinking uh, yeah we'll probably just talk about gdpr for about four hours um but <laughs> but, but compliance is is a massive one because you know most organizations it's what is one of the things where it's often the the last thing that's looked at once the you know the business is growing everything's going great oh okay we got to go and do this compliance thing now for some organizations that's just um you know a tick in a box and and for those organizations that's probably acceptable but for other organizations who are more kind of forward thinking around it um actually managing that data appropriately is is uh, going to be beneficial to them in multiple ways so I'm assuming, Dave that you agree with that and compliance is um, a fairly major I, I role I do I, I mean I yeah, I, I do. I, I, you know, my um, you know, my background 
you know, some focused years working uh, actually in you know uh, data governance and and uh, information management for compliance. And uh, you know, I, I'd say that one of the key things is um, getting you know just being able to get your hand back on the data in a way that allows you to provide and execute better data hygiene, right? Is 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 critical in a, in a way that isn't disruptive to the business. You know the the old school way was uh, you know if I, if I just kind of for a second you know look at litigation for example. You know the old model uh, to, and still very much alive today in a lot of companies is uh, I go and I grab disks and I stack them up in the IT department, right? Uh, because, or you know I image the disks or I do something uh, where I'm copying all that data and storing it somewhere else. Litigation rules change from country to country, but you know the, the ultimate thing around chain of custody and manageability of data becomes much more difficult as the amount of data expands, right? And so, you know, you started thinking about these challenges that businesses are facing. Um, it, it's no wonder, you know, you can, you know, yeah, there's been plenty of uh, you know, legal lawsuits where, you know, there was a there was a litigation, there was an ask for data to be held, and then either that data was lost or purged or you know, wasn't recoverable or was on some tape that no tape drive in the world can read anymore or something like that. Um, and, you know, that, that becomes a big issue uh, for businesses. But, I, you know, I think that, you know, the benefit ultimately is getting that uh, visibility again, being able to, you know, look at something like uh, GDPR and feel like a lot more confidence in the fact that you've got a, a better grasp of your data, where it is, and how it's being managed and handled, uh, which I think uh, you know scares a lot of companies today. Um, yeah. And you know, I also look at the benefit being ransomware is not going away. Um, you know, it, it ebbs and flows just like a lot of things in the world. And you know, with the last uh, attack, you know, with uh, uh, WannaCry, or we were dealing with wipeware, right? Yeah. Um, if you're a business and you're regulated um, in the United States, uh, you know, any ransomware attack on a hospital or any organization that deals with healthcare records, it automatically becomes a HIPAA uh, a violation and has to be accounted for. You know, so you your businesses are a lot more pressure today uh, with a lot more at play. It's no longer, you know, simple hackers with, you know, most of your challenges being internal. Now there's this great external pressure that really could put the data at risk. And, you know, we've seen businesses where, you know, their whole on-premises environment was compromised, including complete deletion of their backup sets. Um, so, you know, you're, you're talking about businesses that are literally taken down to their knees and, and their recovery process is going to be off tape which uh, is not a fun process for anybody. You'd say, cross your fingers and hope it all comes back together. <laughs> data management services trying to achieve is visibility in that data, manageability, understanding context of that data, be able to provide a bit of an early warning system to maybe changes in the data as it's being collected that could give you insight into, you know what, there is something going on here that looks like it's a potential ransomware attack, right? Or there's data here that uh, Bob Johnson's seems to have on his, on his device that he shouldn't have. Why does he have all that data, right? Hmm. Uh, maybe it's PII or PHI. Um, or this Office 365 workspace just got deleted and we need to recover it. There's a lot of elements today, and I just you know, don't want to go on too long here, but there's a lot of elements today where if you, you don't know what you don't know um, that are coming more and more into play that data management is really trying to help them solve. Yeah. So, um, not mean to name names, but what solutions are available in the market for um, data management as a service? And has he got any aliases that you know people might have otherwise know it by? Yeah, I mean, I, from from my perspective, you know, I there's definitely a lot of kind of uh, what I would call more um, domain. Uh, vendors, right? So, you know, we, we look at the whole space of data management as a service kind of end to end. Um, there's very few folks that are actually kind of doing that whole spread. It te- typically, you'll have folks that focus specifically on data protection, right? You know, you have a lot of kind of the traditional architected systems, but they're not data management as a service. They're 
they're trying to be data management and service, maybe by, you know, heavy lifting those workloads into the cloud and operating there. But, you know, one of the concerns there is that can be very expensive. I, I, I often, um, just as a side note here, you know, often tell people you, understanding cloud and our cloud architecture is very important uh, for businesses as they move forward, especially for IT teams, because the cost is going to be either very expensive or a very advantageous depending on how the vendor architected for the cloud. Um, now, the the thing that I explain to people on a very simple level is that it's the difference between building on top of an operating system, building your application directly on top of an operating system, which is like the cloud, right? I see it right, our company, we see it that AWS is an operating system that they're providing services that we're building applications on, right? Yeah. Versus I'm running a virtual workload on top of the cloud, right? You know, and it's a distinction that's subtle, but it's important because um, fundamentally what you really want to do is have this ability to have data management across a broad range of data, whether those are, you know, on-premises applications, whether those are SaaS services or cloud data workloads, um, but also you want to make sure that it's not like a billion dollars to do that. And so it's very important to be, you know, built on top of the system. And then, you know, so yeah, so you have your traditional cloud kind of, you have data protection vendors. Some of them are operating instances in the cloud. You have uh, a lot of the kind of the governance vendors, but um, a lot of the governance vendors are mostly on premises solutions still today. There's only been I haven't seen a lot of movement in that space towards as a service completely. I think it's because of the kind of the proximity to data that a lot of them still feel that they need to have um, or to systems, you know, whether that's crawling systems for searching capability or, um, you know, archiving that data in mass. And then from the intelligence space, you know, it's a really fairly new area. You know, there, there were some ways to do it in kind of the old classical model, but kind of in the new model, um, you know, the implementation of things like uh, machine learning and some of these things in a more practical manner, you know, not self-driving cars, but, you know, understanding data patterns better, um, you know, and anomalies and things like that. Um, I think there's, uh, that's an area that's growing uh, to their uh, growing interest of ours as a company, because again, when you're dealing with petabytes of data, it can be, uh, it can be quite, <laughs> quite untenable. Um, <laughs> So, you know, so there are vendors, um, you know, in, you know, in ancillary spaces, you know, you have, you know, compliance monitoring vendors, you have either the vendors that scour the data, um, then you have, you know, seam vendors, which are external, uh, right, looking at logs and audit trails and things like that. I even call them somewhat a coopetition because some of them are actually uh, <laughs> partner companies, right, because there are opportunities there to actually solve the problem by stitching some of these products together uh, and providing a more uh, enterprise kind of ecosystem type platform, especially when you're dealing with kind of a lot of legacy applications and things like that. I think that, that I think you've nailed it there. I think before you kind of start down the road of even looking at who are all the key kind of players in the space of what technologies are available. I suppose the first step that I'd be looking at before even adopting any form of data management solutions is is to look at um, what are the actual organization's requirements in the first place. You know, there's a there's an age old adage around measure twice, cut once. Right. You know, in, t in terms of, well, I do quite a lot of DIY at the moment, so that one's <laughs> going through my head a lot. The moment. <laughs> but, the, you know, it, it absolutely applies, I think, to any of these types of situations. Once you firstly understand your requirements as an organization, what is it you want to achieve with the data? You, what, what do you think you can actually get out of that data? And what is it you actually need to do in terms of data protection, data governance, et cetera? Um, I think the next step is probably actually analyzing what you've got because you know to our point right at the start of the show we were talking about actually comprehending what what is it you have and classifying that data because until you've classified it and analyzed what you actually have you can't then go on to start deciding on which vendors to start working with or you know what's going to be the most appropriate solution for your organization right, based right. on a particular business need um and then obviously after that you start needing to look at well, what do I do in order to say map out how my data is actually processed? Because it's great, I've classified it now. Okay, brilliant. But then I need to work out how am I processing it, where am I processing it, how am I securing it and storing it? And to your point earlier on, you know, how how am I making sure that I'm meeting discovery requirements and and also deleting data when it reaches an appropriate age? I suppose the last point I'd probably make there though would be 
what would be the lowest impact you know you you go out you go out and look at these different products that are available and these different services that are available and it might be that one meets them all or you might need to you know take several together to meet your business requirements but what you really want to do is choose something that is the lowest impact to your users your administrators etc and mm-hmm. their processes right. because back to that ppt you know the people process and technology piece if you make the process complex you know you're not going to get buy-in from anybody so I, I think probably ease equals adoption, I suppose, is the, the simplest way to describe it. That's great. Right. That sounded a lot to me like some key steps to a business adopting data management as a solution. So that's <laughs> absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, I mean, Dave, do you agree with all that? What are Driva doing in this space? Yeah, you know, I think we start looking at, um, you know, organization, and, and I agree with Alex on this, it's a, you really have to understand kind of you know where your data is what your flows are and kind of ultimately what you what you are going to treat achieving as a business right you know there's organizations that don't need to retain data for long periods of time it's a question of if you're keeping a short time you might want to take a different approach than if you're trying to store data for a long period of time or you need to keep snapshots for years or whatever adoption you know what we've seen is organizations need to take like uh, bite-sized chunks right and uh, you know this is what uh, alex is alluding to which is you, you can make it overly complex and once you do that you know nothing ever happens you know if it's uh, or <laughs> it happens in a way that becomes very expensive organizations tend to start with you know the data protection vector right um let's figure out kind of where our sources are what needs to be managed from meeting the core slas of the business and resiliency and availability of that data uh, in a way that uh, you know we know we're we're uh, shoring that piece up you know so if there's a ransomware attack or something like that um, you know the data is in isolation in the cloud that means that it's uh, removed from the direct environment and won't be infected so we can recover from it those types of things and then, you know, move, uh, you know, I kind of go left to right. You start with protection, then you start looking at the governance elements, right? And then you start looking at the intelligence uh, elements. And I, I bring that up also because that's the common pattern of most businesses in their, the way that they adopt, right? They start with a technology they think will solve a problem in their business. Um, then, as Alex mentioned earlier, which I've seen so many times in my life, it's scary. Then businesses say, oh, well, compliance is something and security is something we really have to think about here, <laughs> right? And so that's usually kind of like the next element, right? And yep. that's where the governance piece comes in critically. And then, um, you know, intelligence is then, you know, now I've got my data under control. I understand where it is. I've got the right security elements in place. I understand it from a compliance standpoint. Now, what is that next stage of how we can um, better embrace the data and use it for the business and, and, you know, and ultimately protect the business better, but also um, provide even maybe better insights into trends and changes in the business that uh, might be impactful for, you know, change and better agility, et cetera. Cool. That's brilliant. And Alex, from a consultative approach, are you seeing exactly that? It's a good question. Um, I think uh, from, from a data management perspective. Uh, so I, I work a lot with kind of mid-market organizations as well as, as I say, that's, uh, some enterprises. Um, I think in the mid-market, that's still relatively immature. I think to Dave's point, you know, data protection is obviously where a lot of organizations start from. Um, but what I think is probably lacking in some cases is is more of a holistic view of what are the what what is it that the the organization actually requires overall and what are they going to need moving into the future you know sometimes there's like almost a short termist view of right this is the thing that's on fire at the moment so we're going to go and fix that first whereas actually maybe the long term the the benefit would be to step back and say right okay where are we actually going as an organization um what are we actually doing around a data management strategy and Potentially having then a, a roadmap on, into which you can start to slot, you know, gradual improvements over time. For example, I think uh, what's probably happened though more recently, you know, we mentioned GDPR earlier on. Organisations have suddenly been almost like hit with a red hot poker, and they're like, oh god, we're going to actually have to do something about all these other bits that we just haven't had the time yet to to really look at in depth. Yeah. Um, and so, I think probably the, the the phase that many of those organizations are still at right now is the first phase of adoption. So it's still that, you know, requirements gathering, identification, classification before they can even go through to um, later phases in in adoption of a, of a proper data management strategy. So on right. that point, Dave, the people that are leveraging this service, are they using it to its full potential? 
Um, I, you know, I, I align um, mostly with Alex on this. I think, uh, are they using it to the full potential? Not yet. I think um, organizations are still trying to get their minds around um, where their data is moving to and what those implications are. A lot of businesses uh, are still learning about what their uh, resiliency is within Office 365, for example. Um, you know, a lot of organizations don't know that they can't recover data long-term from Office 365. We've seen a lot of businesses in the last six to nine months just starting to go, wow, we need to have a more broader data protection footprint across this type of data because I'm not going to be able to archive or recover data, especially if it's lost over the long term, right? Or if it's corrupted and there's no way to uh, recover it back. So data management as a service adoption, still very early because folks are still getting their heads around understanding what it can provide um, and and how it can actually benefit them at the end of the day. And my, my point in Office 365 is there's still some lack of awareness of of some of the challenges even, right? Because people haven't experienced them yet, and they're just under the assumption that things will operate as they're expected to. Where we see the bigger change is now with companies adopting a model of using AWS or doing their own cloud deployments, where um, they're becoming educated much deeper on kind of the kind of new you know, matrix of <laughs> of our puzzle, whatever you want to call it, of, you know, data moving around. And they're starting to go, hmm, you know, we need something to help us solve this problem. And, and that, I think, is, uh, you know, really is turning on the lights for a lot of people of, boy, this is a challenge. I will say, though, that GDPR is a, is a very big, you know, hot poker, as they say, uh, <laughs> because... <laughs> that's opening people's minds to like, what are we doing here? And it's not just the IT department, it's the compliance part of the organization, right? It's the the CISO or the legal department saying, what are we doing to align to GDPR, right? Absolutely. We have to go to a GDPR assessment and they're asking us all these questions in control. What have we done? What are we doing? And uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on folks to kind of rethink it. And I think that's really where we'll see the biggest uptick in, in visibility around data management as a service as people start recognizing that that is a way to start bridging that gap and making the step in the right direction. Yeah, the, I mean, the funny thing there with the whole GDPR thing is the actual mm -hmm. percentage of the points in GDPR, which are directly IT related, is actually relatively small. Um, right, you know, right. It's, it's a far, far bigger challenge and an issue to to organizations then you know it's the it department's problem um and right. to your point about resourcing you know the resourcing goes way well above and beyond just the guys and girls available in the it department there's there needs to be buy-in from all parts of the business to actually make a proper data management you know strategy work as a business as a whole right so i think we've covered this off in a few places now but i'll just double check i mean what is Druva's approach to protecting data in the cloud well, so Druva's focus is really uh, one of kind of bringing all these different domains together, you know, whether it's, you know, on-premises data, SaaS data, or IAS, PAS type data, right? So, you know, if you're running cloud, cloud workloads, we have ability to bring those into the system. If you're running SaaS workloads, bringing that data into the system. If you're on-premises workloads, bringing that data in. And yeah, it sounds like a lot of data, and it is a lot of data, um, but the cloud provides us the ability, having the capacity and the elasticity um, to actually bring in the large volumes of data in mass to be able to provide uh, overall, you know, better policy management and visibility and access to data. The as a service element is very much that we we have a core competency as a business in cloud. And I tell people that that's not just a technical element. That's also, you know, how we operate our business and both, you know, economically as well as just how, you know, we provide our services to customers in the sense of, for example, consumption-based pricing, right? Which is, you know, basically metered usage of data uh, within our system but also just how we economically manage the model to make sure that it's more cost efficient for a business. One of the core uh, foundational elements of Druva is that um, you know, we have multiple patents on our deduplication technology and storage technology, um, which is built on, on top of AWS. So two, two birds with one stone. Um, what the technology allows us to do is dramatically minimize the data footprint because it does uh, do it globally across all those sources. Uh, so, you know, huge reduction, 70, 80% at times. Um, and 
also provides a system that auto tiers the data across storage tiers inside of AWS's data ages. So uh, we we'll call auto archiving, which allows us to um, move data to lower cost storage without replicating it. And so it's very it's a very interesting model. But you know what we really want to do is solve the protection, governance, and intelligence challenge yeah. when you're a business that's got all these data, all this data across all these different areas uh, that you're really trying, struggling with as it continues to grow and kind of, as Alex mentioned, kind of get out of control, right? So how do you bring more sanity to the chaos uh, of managing the life cycle of that data so you're not holding everything forever, so you're not worried about GDPR, so you're not uh, worried about resiliency and recoverability in the case of a ransomware attack, right? Where you have the ability to have insights into the data and identify trends or issues or even discovery from the standpoint of just different parts of the organization being able to identify information that might be useful. That's brilliant. I think we've kind of covered off the fact that we're beginning of what will be a huge thing um, in data management as a service. Um, So where do you see the future for it? Uh, You know, the future of data management as a service, I think, um, is going to heavily lean on the data intelligence side, which is why it's such an important aspect of it. Um, you know, as you know, these workloads continue to kind of spread and, you know, we, what ultimately you want as a business is to focus less on, again, you know, kind of the plumbing and all the elements underneath, focus more on the actual identification of information, um, where it is, how it's being managed, how data is moving around from cloud on premises or vice versa or to other services. Um, or even to multiple clouds. You know, you might be a business that, you know, spreads across Google, Azure, and AWS. Yeah. You know, so, you know, data management as a service is really looking at the larger view of, you know, how do you get your arms around all this data, but also provide greater insights for the business. And I think there's some great things that are going on in especially the machine learning space to help organizations identify data uh, much quicker um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, apply policy to it. You know, it goes back to what Alex was mentioning, you know, classification and being able to then make decisions for the business based on classification, whether it's uh, disposition of data or whether that's, um, you know, gaining greater insights into business trends that could, you know, ultimately mean, you know, new breakthroughs. Um, you know, if you look at uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, a large pharma Pharmaceutical companies have, you know, global offices with research centers around the world. How do you provide them better access to data and insights, information that's classified as research documentation that maybe another group in the business is working on to help them solve problems or help them, you know, circumvent having to spend the next six months doing certain types of testing? All of that, I think, ultimately, they adds to agility. Uh, while, again, aligning to compliance and everything else without slowing the business down. And I think fundamentally that's the core benefit, right? Yeah. Um, providing a way to not to slow the business down uh, while ensuring the control, compliance, alignment, all those other elements. I, I completely great. agree with you. The, the only other thing I'd, I'd probably add to that, I mean, I think um, the challenge is only going to get bigger over time with the, you know, the quantities of data that we're producing and right. how to manage. And, um, you know, from, from multi-cloud to, you know, we'll b- bring out the buzzwords, big, big, big data and IoT and uh, log analytics mm-hmm. and all these other things. But, um, you know, I, th- I was having an interesting conversation with a customer recently who was talking about how much they have to manage with the amount of resources that they have. And resources are either shrinking or, or reducing from a people perspective, whilst at the same time, volumes of data are growing significantly. So you know, their, their point was five years ago, there's no way they could have ever achieved what they're doing today with the same number of people. So in terms of um, data management as a service, uh, policy driven management and management of greater quantities of data and greater or broader types of data being managed by smaller and smaller teams is probably going to be right. more and more feasible in the future. What I didn't I forgot to mention is IoT, right, which is huge. We, we have customers, for example, who are in the medical device field that have machines you know, that are, you know, collecting information that they want to be able to access and analyze and they need to store for long periods of time. And, you know, IoT is going to continue to boom, you know, from everything from, you know, data coming from cars, right? Um, How do you, as a business, you know, uh, if you are a company that owns, you know, or manages self-driving cars, 
how do you ensure that all that data is brought together? Because that's going to be a regulated industry, right? And that's going to generate a lot of data. Um, matter of fact, could be you know terabytes of data per day, uh, per car or something like that. Um, and you know you're going to need to go through that same process with that type of data. So that's a, you know just a kind of an insight into kind of another area that's you know booming as well that will change. Yeah. So we bring on the edge computing. <laughs> yes. Um, so really, the future of this are getting faster, bigger, and smarter, which is great news. Um, guys, if you're happy, I'm happy to wrap up. If people would great. like to get in contact with you, um, Dave, how can they get hold of you? I'm uh, accessible via Twitter. I'm at the Packer Man. If you, people want to reach out to me directly, they can. I'm uh, dave.packer at druva.com. I'm happy to answer questions or, or respond to any inquiries or questions you have around uh, data management as a service or any of the ancillary areas of governance and kind of what you're trying to achieve today. So feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. Brilliant. And Alex? Probably the best way is, is via social media for me. Twitter is my is my social media platform of choice. So you can find me on Twitter at Alex Galbraith. Um, I've got links to you know my blog, which is uh, techhead.it from there as well. Probably slightly less uh, less busy on there as I used to be due to all the DIY things I was mentioning <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> but uh, that's certainly the best portal to start from. And and as a, just as a quick plug as well, you mentioned earlier on Open Techcast. Um, we have a we have a kind of broad spectrum podcast that we talk about a wide variety of subjects um so you can check that out at opentechcast.com that's brilliant well thank you very much both of you thank you very much great thank you really appreciate it thank you for listening to this episode of cloud insiders to find out more and to listen to additional episodes go to cloudinsiders.fm you can follow us on 